Pleasure to be here. So low carbon comfort and cooling coalition, or we call it LC4, uh, it's an initiative for collective action. We know the cooling conundrum that's in front of us. There is a need for including, increasing access to cooling for various reasons, health, productivity, uh, and at the same time, there is an imperative to reduce climate impact. We know that in countries in the South, and especially India, there is a massive need for cooling, which is also uh, combined with the fact that there is very uh, small part of the population that actually has access to cooling. We know that thermal comfort is a basic need. Comfort is not just about air conditioning. Global as well as urban temperatures are rising and we are urbanizing very rapidly. Poorly designed structures make this problem worse. And it's not just the structures, our cities and neighborhoods as well. And this cooling, the way it is going, will drive up not just the energy use, but also our peak demand. So what is new, right? This is, we, we know this already. All of this is uh, out there for us to see. At the same time, we also see there is unprecedented effort in the last 15 years to address this. There are policies and action plans. There are codes and standards. There's labeling programs. There's awareness programs. We've had challenges and prizes. We've had national and global funding for these uh, initiatives. We did a survey, and there are over 40 global programs and initiatives addressing this cooling issue. There are, uh, the transition, though, is yet to take off. So what is the secret sauce that is required to make this change happen? We feel that while everyone is aware of the challenges and is taking action in various ways, there is a need for coordinated and collective action. Therefore, this coalition. Low Carbon Comfort and Cooling Coalition is a mission-driven alliance that addresses the challenges of reducing demand as well as carbon intensity of cooling through collective action. The LC4 approach is straightforward. One, pay attention to reducing the need for cooling. That means better buildings and cities, better environment. And at the same time, increase energy efficiency of cooling through low carbon alternatives. The values that it is driven, which is what brings it together, which is what we see is a gap currently. It needs to be mission driven. Uh, that means we need to see actions on the ground with an outcome-based approach. And that outcome-based approach needs to be measurable. We need to see what is actually the change that's happening on the ground and be able to uh, measure it. Public sector as a champion, leveraging the power of procurement as well as driving this large-scale change. And finally, industry leadership, because that's where innovation is, and bringing those system-driven solutions, slightly different from the product-driven solutions, to the market. And in the end, end user focus, that means creating a sustainable market, which is the, and the underlying affordability so that we have affordable comfort for all. With this, the LC4 focus areas for reducing building demand is to reduce urban and local temperatures, reduce need for cooling, use passive and low energy cooling systems. So that's one part. And the other part is reduce carbon intensity through increasing efficiency of the conventional systems that we have alternatives and innovative cooling strat strategies and technologies, innovative delivery approaches, so going from individual to central cooling and cooling as a service, and finally, giving the control back to users in terms of adapting to the comfort conditions and controlling the cooling as they want. We think with all of these things, LC4 will support policy and regulatory actions, create a forum for cooling between development agencies, accelerate new technology development and adoption, financing through a funding forum, uh, an industry R&D focus and funding for that, 
funding for the end users, because ultimately it's the consumers who are paying for it. And finally, how do you fund cities and communities to make them better? All of this is through coordinated action, long-term vision, and all the issues we talked about. And the impact is enhancing the effort that are already being made. So enhancing comfort for people, enhancing access to cooling, enhancing affordability, enhancing productivity, enhancing the market, and finally, enhancing our mitigation efforts. So with that, we feel that this is the right time for all of us to put together and take this coalition forward. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Lawasa. Thank you very much, Tanpai, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, recall that uh, 45 years ago when I was working, air conditioning was relatively a very rare kind of service or comfort which was available. In fact, we came across a term which, of course, as students, we found it very uh, interesting. That was that air conditioners were considered items of conspicuous consumption. And even after joining the civil services, uh, you could, it took me about eight years to be entitled to sit in an air conditioned car. And it took me equal number of time or maybe more to have an air conditioner in my office because this was conspicuous consumption and as public servant, you needed a certain seniority to be entitled for air conditioning. In fact, central air conditioning was relatively unknown. Uh, refrigeration penetration was quite low. And air conditioned coaches in trains were also relatively unknown or maybe an odd train had air conditioning. But what we have witnessed in the last 40, more, more than 40 years, is considerable economic growth. And I think one of the inevitable manifestations of that economic growth is urbanized. And the other aspect is that this quest for the convenience of life and making life a little more comfortable, I think that seems to be a logical yearning as pro economic. And as if this was not enough, things got complicated because of climate change. And before uh, coming for this panel discussion, I was uh, reading and I came across uh, the fact that the G20 Climate Risk Atlas has warned that heat waves across India were likely to last 25 times longer by 2036 if carbon emissions remain high. In 2021, a study by Lancet Planetary Health Journal, researchers found that nearly 740,000 excess deaths in India annually can be attributed to abnormal hot and cold temperatures related to climate change. By 2030, India may account for 34 million of the projected 80 million global job losses from heat stress associated productivity decline. And when you go through the IEA report on the future of cooling, it is stated there that the world is facing a looming cold crunch. In fact, the demand for cooling is hotting up. Everybody wants cooling. And the use of energy for space cooling has more than tripled between 1990 and 2016, tripling the global sales of air conditioners and equally tripling emissions which come out of. But even now, out of the 2.8 billion people living in the hottest parts of the world, only 8% currently possess air conditioning, compared to 90% in US or Japan. Thus, cooling becomes the strongest driver of growth in building 
electricity demand responsible for 40% of the total growth. The share of space cooling in peak electricity load projected to rise sharply, with the biggest increase occurring in hot countries such as India, where the share jumps from 10% to 45% in 2050. In the demand analysis which has been done by Bureau of Energy Efficiency for 2027 for India, it is projected that cooling energy demand in India will double until 2027. 50% of this, 57% of this comes from buildings and around 25 gigawatts of new coal capacity can be avoided by energy efficiency in cooling and further, significant energy and emission savings is possible through improvement in servicing practices of cooling devices and refrigerate. And I just want to share with you that the IEA report that I referred to, it also states that policies to improve the efficiency on air conditioning could quickly curb demand. In fact, it is mentioned in that report that globally the use of energy for space cooling in the efficient cooling scenario grows by less than half as much as in the business as usual scenario. And it reduces the need to build new generation capacity to meet peak demand. Further, the cumulative savings in the efficient cooling scenario amounts to $3 trillion over 2017 to 2050. Now, in this scenario, the India Cooling Action Plan, which was launched in 2019, is a welcome step. It is a kind of detailing that is required if countries are serious about implementing or achieving their NDCs. The plan aims to provide sustainable cooling measures across various sectors, including indoor cooling in buildings, cold chain, and refrigeration in the agriculture and pharmaceutical sectors, and air conditioning in passenger transport. Its aim is to reduce the demand for cooling by up to 25% by 2038. But the question is, and that is my first question to the distinguished panelists, and I would request each one of them to respond uh, for about a minute or a minute and a half. And the question is, is the plan itself enough? Are the targets enough to achieve low carbon comfort and cooling for all? What additional push do we aim for? And indeed, in this context, what is your perspective on LC4 that was just mentioned by Tanmay? So let me first begin with Urva. And then I'll request Sangeeta and Vishal and Saurabh in that order. Apurva, please. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll begin with um, the first set of questions, whether the targets are good enough, whether they can be met, what else needs to be done, and then what is LC4 really going to do or has the vision for? I think the targets are well set. If you look at the ICAP, the targets are quite well set. The question is the implementation of those targets. Uh, what is the action that's needed on ground to be able to achieve those targets? And that's where I think we are struggling as a country, um, both from the government perspective as well as from the industry perspective. And that kind of led to us thinking about what needs to be done in a more concerted, co you know, cohesive fashion that brings the different actors together to actually make it happen on ground. A very action-oriented platform, uh, which brings in, uh, you know, uh, several actors needed for the action plan to actually be implemented on ground, whether it is the cutting-edge technologies, or I won't even call it technologies because our approach is reducing the demand first. So uh, solutions, I would say. Uh, which are sitting there on the fence, but because of the affordability factor, and also the, uh, the factor that they have not been customized 
to, uh, you know, or tested in the Indian conditions. And I will even go further step in the South Asia community as a whole. And I would see LC4 looking at South Asia as a whole because of the same cooling conundrum that, you, that exists across the South Asian countries. So getting in the te industry technology players uh, to be piloting and testing those and customizing it in these conditions. Also looking at where will the investment come in from. So whether it is uh, you know, looking at low cost financing, whether it's multilaterals, philanthropies, uh, climate funds, and even uh, and and then make these projects really bankable. So end users become very important, and I would say public sector would should be championing, uh, you know, entities like railways, uh, one of the largest power consumers, NTPC itself, which is being represented here, and many such public sector entities taking a really lead in sort of testing, piloting, and uh, you know, mainstreaming in terms of large scale. And then I look at entities like, you know, ESL, uh, their demand aggregation model, the way they, uh, you know, they are really taking the cutting edge technologies, raising the bar of energy efficiency through their very efficient tender design, and also signaling to the manufacturing community that, look, there is a demand that exists. They are doing that demand aggregation so that the industry has the confidence that they can change their product lines into much higher efficiency standards. Uh, and once these technologies are tested, piloted in the end user community, then these can be actually transferred or mainstreamed into the market through entities like ESL. So that's what my hope is. And, and the second part is that as USAID, we have played a catalytic role in many sectors across the yeah, power I, sector. I'll come to that okay. later. But in the meanwhile, Sankita, do you have any opening observations on the questions I raised. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, sir, for giving uh, me this opportunity. Uh, but before I answer your question, I just since I am from NTPC, and uh, cooling plays a very, very critical role in power demand. I would just like to share certain figures with the learned audience. Uh, see, and I'm very happy that today, sir, this is the most critical cooling is the most critical blind spot of the energy debate. And I'm very glad that that has been brought to the focus today. Uh, uh, irony is that the more we cool, the more we heat the planet. That is the challenge. Uh, but as you said, sir, cooling may have been a luxury some years ago, but it is now a necessity and a human right. So we definitely have to look at it. Uh, if we really see, uh, we witness this very practically in the month of September, when our generation grew 10.7% to 140 billion units in September, just due to the increased use of cooling appliances. And this was 10.7% higher than last year, which was 126.91 billion units. So that is the difference that is going to come in the future years. And as Sir had said, this is only when uh, this air conditioning load in India is only about 5%, and it is 90% in US. And if access, and if it becomes a necessity and a human right, which it is becoming, then this 10% will increase many times over. So uh, reducing the carbon, reducing the cooling demand and the carbon intensity of cooling is one of the very important pathways. There is no doubt about it. So, but as you had said, Indian cooling action plan, the targets were set, those are all defined. Labeling scheme is also there. Energy conservation building code was al has also been brought in. They have only nudged cooling supply and demand to some extent. This is what I... Uh, so addressing the cooling challenge will require a multi-sectoral interagency coordination and international coordination. That will be the need. And I think LC4 has, uh, would be the need of the R to accelerate both the adoption of the new cooling technology, uh, mobilize the right investments into sustainable cooling technology, and scale new business. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Vishal. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we as humanity have pulled off a remarkable feat. Uh, we are going to be the hottest year. 2023 is going to be the hottest year. 
uh, and this is basically the tragedy of commons because you are heating up, the cooling demand keeps on going up. Additional demand, they say that 60% of the additional energy demand is going to come from the cooling side. And this vicious loop that we are in, we need to have a break. And policies, uh, frameworks are already in place. The real challenge is always in, in the operations or in the implementation. So to that extent, the concept of coalition is absolutely imperative. But what level of coalition? I mean, LC4 here, coalition in, in the international arena, and coalition first, we talked about the public sector. Amongst the public sector and the government agencies only, because a coordinated effort, whenever it has been done by the public sector and the governments together, that has seen a, 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 any perceptible improvement. Uh, simple examples like electric mobility, whether smart metering, or let's say an LED revolution in the past, it is only as a result of coalition. And this tragedy of commons that we are all facing, it can be done only through collaborations. That is my single uh, Thank point. you. I think that's excellent. All right. Thank you, sir. I, I couldn't agree more with what Vishal said. Uh, I'll just pick up two, three things sir, from your statistics. 8% penetration of AC is going up to maybe 30% uh, by 2030. I remember an LBNL report saying that if that were to happen, in 2030, this country will need 150 gigawatts of incremental cooling demand. But if we change the course of our, of our policies and regulations, you can reduce it by 60 gigawatts. So my first uh, uh, the, the thing is, I don't think we are ambitious enough as a country still. I mean, while Vishal ESL has done a brilliant job in introducing super efficient air conditioners, we don't see B uh, ramping up their <clears throat> policies and regulations to attract. And we must also remember, sir, this is one technology in the last 100 years that has not seen a, a disruption like we have seen in uh, lighting or any other forms of technology. So it's really important for us to make sure that the, the ambition is, is, uh, uh, is, is up. And I think a coalition like this with, I think the Bureau of Energy Efficiency also in, in, into this coalition is extremely important. Thank you, uh, Saurabh. And the figures that you mentioned about rising demand, in fact, uh, the IA analysis that I quoted just now, the demand for space cooling alone has risen at an average pace of 4% per year since 2000. With 10 million new homes required to be built annually to keep up with the Indian housing, there is a huge opportunity to introduce natural cooling techniques in all the new construction, even including retrofitting in some of the old buildings. So I think this offers a great opportunity for India to foster innovation and investment in the sector by providing a conducive policy environment. And in that regard, I would request you, Apurva, if you could share USAID's vision and expectation from LC4, and what is the level of commitment that USAID itself has for LC4? And indeed, what are your expectations from other development aid agencies? Um, so, um, to begin with, uh, USAID has been in the cooling space for decades now, uh, and not just cooling, but uh, efficiency, I would say, from right from building efficiency to cooling efficiency. And uh, also right from the building codes that the government of India first made uh, that we supported the design and development of to the first public uh, private partnership in the form of first uh, green building that was set up in Hyderabad CIA GBC to the setting up of the Indian Green Building Council to the first net zero energy building definition coming in in the country in 2013 when this word was not really heard of, and then Bureau of Energy Efficiency really adopting that definition and putting India's, you know, nationally determined contributions, this language of near zero uh, came in into the existence. 
And then we moved on to net zero buildings. And from there, the narrative moved on to seeding a new thought of grid interactive net zero energy buildings. We've been trying to seed in new things, new concepts, new ideas. We've also been trying to um, um, catalyze different actors to come together and, and not just uh, you know, uh, be there. We also understand that our resources um, are not enough to do it all alone. And therefore, a collective action is needed. And that was the genesis of, we all understand we are a pretty well-informed audience here. And the panelists, distinguished panelists, have already spoken about the need for a coalition. Cooling is definitely one of the biggest challenges that not just India, but across Asia that we are facing. So what is it that is not letting things happen on ground? As Saurabhji also pointed out, the ambition has not been there. The, um, that's not been there, but a lot of efforts are happening in silos. So there are separate coalitions happening, maybe at the policy level. There are also startup incubators uh, for getting new cooling technologies on the foray. But nothing has really collectively come together, and that's what the expectation that we have from this. And not just looking at it from an Indian market perspective, but also looking at it across Asia, across emerging economies, and also how uh, you know, how the international community, the investment community, uh, the technology industry players, the end users and large aggregators like ESL, how this all can be pulled together through this coalition so that real tangible action happens on ground. The newer cutting edge technologies come to the mainstream. They become affordable, they become available and accessible to the consumer. So that's what our expectation is. As far as what we are going to do about this, we've already seeded this concept. We are going to flesh it out. This is the second consultation that we are having. We've already had one round of industry consultation. This is the second one. Now we hope to do with Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the other government stakeholders, then maybe with the philanthropic uh, and the multilaterals, bilaterals, then the other investors, and get them all together to get this going and see how this can get traction so that international commitment also comes in. But we are pretty, um, you know, uh, that way we keep ourselves in a very uh, separate lane in terms of not really calling it a, a political action or nothing. It's about really doing things on ground, making things happen. That's what my biggest expectation is. Thank you. So clearly what is coming out is that uh, every stakeholder needs to act and there is a need for all of us to act together. Uh, you spoke about the introduction of new standards, new technology. And I want to turn to Sangeeta that uh, the 2027 improved scenario, it suggests that even with the known strategies and technology, we are not even factoring in disruptive technologies, there is a potential to reduce the aggregated growth in energy demand by 17% and reducing emissions by 20%. And the energy savings of about 20 MTOE can be leveraged between business and usual and improved scenario by 2027. So NTPC, as the leading provider of electricity in the country, you also have a net zero roadmap. How is NTPC addressing the rising cooling demand while also moving towards low carbon footprints? And also, if you can uh, explain to us, what, according to your thinking, what are the gaps that the LC4 can address in realization of the vision of Net Zero? Thank you, sir. Uh, NTPC is a leader in power generation, uh, but I'm very happy to share with my panel, distinguished panelists and the learned audience that NTPC is leading the journey of energy transition also. Uh, we have already, uh, we are working on a net zero roadmap with Niti Ayo, uh, but uh, we have already set ourselves a target of 60 gig, achieving 60 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2032. And we are working towards it. We already have a 3.3 gigawatt capacity of RE and about a similar amount of hydro also in our portfolio. So we are slowly shifting from thermal to uh, addressing all the sources of the energy, uh, we're looking at all the resources of energy. Uh, this is what, sir, we are doing on the supply side. Uh, but uh, NTPC has a large footprint of townships and its offices. 
we are spread across 88 locations across the country. So we are looking at internal consumptions also. And for these internal consumptions, uh, we are looking at how we can reduce, uh, how we can envision net zero townships uh, so that we can, uh, uh, we can have a, we can create a circular ecosystem for that. Uh, we have been implementing energy efficient technologies and practices in our power plants and facilities to reduce the energy consumption. And it also includes optimizing the cooling systems to, uh, to be more energy efficient, using energy efficient chillers and cooling equipment, and improving the overall energy performance of our buildings. Uh, I would also like to share with the audience that, uh, in fact, we are looking at opportunities of how we can use our process heat for cooling purposes. And in fact, we have uh, set up two flue gas based Flue gas waste heat based air conditioning has been developed by our NTPC Netra, which is our R&D division, and it is in uh, uh, working. It is working at Ramagundam and Talcher of two of our power stations, uh, because this is uh, this primary thermal energy is virtually free of cost, so the life cycle cost of air conditioning is very low. And uh, at the NTPC Netra campus itself, we have piloted a solar thermal based air conditioning system. We are, where we are using the heat uh, here, uh, using the water heating through CSP. Uh, so these are the kind of technologies sir, which NTPC is implementing. And I'm sure with the support of, as you were saying, LC4, LC4 can help us in uh, getting more of these sustainable technologies for international cooperation and maybe funding and accessibility and affordability as Apurva has said. Thank you, Sangeeta. In the meanwhile, Manish has joined us from the railways, but I think, to be fair, I should allow him time to cool off. <laughs> and let me turn to Vishal. Like NTPC, uh, ESL also has a net zero vision for 2030. So how crucial is the shift to low carbon solutions for ESL? And in the context of the district pooling that everybody is talking about, uh, how do you approach this requirement of pooling? Uh, the magnitude is too vast, and uh, you are focusing on efficiency. So, how? What is your? What is ESL's approach to this? Thank you, sir. Uh, ESL, as a company, the words two words: energy efficiency services limited. We do anything that is energy efficient, and we do, can. Our institutional mandate is only to usher in energy efficiency and nothing else. To that extent, sir, uh, I would say from the commitment part, ESL will work towards all the energy efficiency measures, uh, even in the cooling side. But uh, you mentioned about district cooling. District cooling uh, is, is a very nascent and a very large uh, uh, subject. But and, and similarly, at the same time, as we stand today, there are not many clients. But I would like to bring the uh, debate back at is the real meat lies in the domestic sector. The, the best energy efficiency interventions and the best uh, investment return in terms of CHG uh, emissions will come from industry and domestic. To that extent, domestic and domestic is completely uh, free to use any kind of star labeling appliances. So, uh, uh, the real effort probably needs to be done on the super efficient AC front. ESL tries to remain ahead of the curve. If there is a five star 5.2 ISCR rating right now, uh, we try to do 5.8 and 6.2. Now, we are coming out with that bid uh, and try to deploy that uh, both in retail as well as in the institutional segments. At the same time, we must not also forget one basic humble electric equipment in a, which is present in our houses, that is the fan. Fan, there is a lot of latent potential. One third of the energy consumption can be cut off through the fans. 78 watt fan versus a 28 watt BLDC fans. We at ESL, we yesterday 2 million bid we have floated. We have launched that program. So, a lot of latent potential lies that there. 
last but not the least in this coalition thing every stakeholder needs to find the right fit you need a pivot who can actually design the coalition and the stakeholders have to get their right fit so that around that pivot they can use their leverage to the maximum extent and this particular fit what esl looks at we we look ourselves only as the implementation partners but in the whole scheme of thing you need to find that pivot it could be usaids of this world it could be any government of india institution but that is definitely required to go ahead sir thank you uh, vishal he spoke of fans and uh, in the indian railways whereas earlier you had only fans in some of the compartments now you have a lot of air conditioning and i find that transport air conditioning is also growing uh, whether it is road or railways it's growing at a considerable pace i think about 12% as far as transport is concerned and less in the railways so as far as the indian railways is concerned as a leading public sector you also have a decarbonization target by 2030 so could you tell us about the steps that railways is taking to uh, you know reduce this energy use while meeting this demand and also what are the learnings that uh, other public sector undertakings can derive from the rail uh, my apologies to be slightly late in coming here uh, to answer the question sir uh, i hope everybody knows that ir has endeavored to be a net zero emitter by 2030 a very challenging uh, goal it has set for itself and but we are uh, striving uh, vigorously in that direction that we achieve it uh, very various uh, um, uh, strategies for it in which uh, one of them is uh, uh, energy efficiency also and uh, in that direction uh, what we have done is one is that we have taken out a, a policy of uh, on energy efficiency over on non traction applications uh, over indian railways in which uh, there are some five action points and uh, one of them uh, uh, targets uh, for sustainable buildings as we know that uh, major consumption as far as uh, the uh, the non -tra our non traction applications is concerned is on the buildings so uh, there we have mandated that uh, all new buildings that we of above 30 kilowatts which generally will be uh, should be uh, uh, super ecbc and uh, 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 the primary objective is to reduce energy consumption because uh, the super ecbc buildings uh, t consume about 50% less energy than an, uh, uh, if you take a ecbc building uh, so uh, there uh, sorry uh, no, normal conventional building and about 25% of the uh, if you see the ecbc uh, buildings so uh, there uh, we, we will and all our uh, we are going in for redevelopment of our stations today in which uh, these norms are being implemented uh, so uh, we we see a huge potential there that we will be using uh, uh, energy efficient uh, equipments there uh, similarly uh, we have mandated uh, that all our appliances that we will be procuring uh, will be uh, be five star rated and uh, as uh, vishal was just mentioning that today uh, the Uh, every every year basically when b comes out with a more energy efficient air conditioning equipment or anything uh, we will be able to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, use that benefit uh, to improve our energy efficiency requirements whatever we are doing uh, as far as the other organizations which can get benefited uh, uh, means basically like uh, we have worked very exclusively to take out this policy uh, which we had done uh, december last year and uh, that can be as a as a useful tool for many other organizations say, in the country they can also uh, take uh, uh, insights from that and uh, make their policies obviously policy does not remain uh, the, the complete thing because ultimately it has to be implemented and uh, so, but then the the base remains the policy so it's very essential that a uh, uh, a comprehensive policy covering all the aspects of the organization's energy 
those all things are taken into account and then we take out a policy. So that way it is very essential. Uh, we are trying to work on, uh, on that direction. Similarly, like again, what Vishal mentioned, now we are again uh, using a lot of fans in our system. So uh, we rather, I would be very interested, like uh, see fans, if we, if we see the fans, then in, if uh, uh, in indoor applications, there is no, no problem as far as BLDC fans are concerned. We are looking forward for putting our fans in the our, uh, in our stations also. There are a lot of fans put up. So there again, it will be required that we have uh, environmentally strong fans because PLDC fans uh, tend to have those uh, inherent uh, difficulties when you are putting it them, them to a harsh environment. Uh, and there uh, means in a station, it can be uh, that type of an environment. So we are working in that direction also. But then we have mandated that we should be using BLDC fans. Cooling, yes, it remains a very uh, important element of our whole affair. So there again, we are concentrating. We are like uh, we are for the existing buildings. What we are trying to do is that uh, we, uh, we intend to do the benchmarking through uh, uh, the energy audits that we will be getting conducted, uh, the investment grade energy audits. And based on those inputs, uh, we would uh, be procuring uh, energy efficient equipments, including air conditioners, uh, uh, which are uh, high, means uh, uh, top of the class air conditioners to get better efficiencies there. I suppose that should be. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, so clearly what we have seen is that whether to meet the rising energy demand for cooling, or to bring in more efficiency in the cooling, a lot of funding is required. And this is an uh, exercise in which perhaps governments, philanthropies, private sector, everybody will have to partner in. So let me turn to uh, Saurabh. I think he's the man for the moment. And how do you see uh, this coalition uh, working in terms of providing a sustainable way forward? And indeed, uh, how do you see the role of philanthropies in this? Thank you, sir. I think uh, I'll not take more than a couple of lines on this. Uh, just to reaffirm our support to this coalition, and also I'll remind everyone, our name itself is a Global Energy Alliance. So we are not, we are not an organization. We are an alliance of partners. We are fully, we'll be very happy to contribute to in whichever way, whether it is uh, 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 resource requirements, human resource or financial resources. But I think I agree that the, it has to be a wider uh, uh, coalition slash alliance, which needs to deliver on, on very actionable targets. Thank you. So that is super efficient. Um, I think what has come out of all uh, the observations of the panelists is uh, that sustainable cooling is not just essential for economic growth. It is critical for the country's health, security, as well as productivity. And in order to turn this vision into reality, uh, my own sense and what has been endorsed by the panel is that the government should develop a comprehensive national policy on cooling, develop necessary regulatory framework, consider including cooling in the national mission on enhanced energy efficiency, or launch a separate mission, and also provide suitable incentives to attract private investment, besides exploring avenues for international cooperation. So I thank all the panelists, and uh, may I now invite John to give his concluding observations, and also the way forward. Thanks very much, uh, Ashok, and Saurabh, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to provide a few quick thoughts uh, wrapping up. Friends, I just got off a plane last night from Washington, D.C., where I was participating in the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure Conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, heat uh, was a major focus of that conference as well because of the detrimental impacts uh, on infrastructure but also as has been elaborated this morning on people and livelihoods as well. So this is a, a nice uh, segue. We've heard from major energy generators and users 
like NTPC, Sangeeta Shared Views, Manish from Railways, from aggregators and program and policy implementers, Vishal shared his views from EESL, and then from uh, Saurabh and uh, Apurva representing uh, philanthropies and development uh, agencies working in this space. My own organization, USAID, has worked for many years with each of these organizations and will continue to uh, do so in the future. As has been shared repeatedly, none of us have sufficient resources to take advantage of all the many opportunities with respect uh, to low carbon uh, cooling uh, systems and technologies in India. As Tanmay suggested in the beginning, this will focus on both passive and active systems and will take advantage of a diversity of different stakeholders and players. We're talking about bringing together government and industry, financial institutions and civil society, uh, energy users and generators, citizens and institutions, and people like you. Uh, we welcome the contributions. I think the United States and India have no dearth of plans and programs, but it is in the implementation uh, that it is so, so important. So we need robust, action-oriented uh, activities that will allow us to achieve uh, the objectives of what is being proposed here under LC4. For my own organization, I can commit uh, our colleagues from the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership and Rakesh Goyal, our chief of party, is sitting in the front. It's going to take a consortium of different actors represented on the stage this morning, and each of us have committed to working uh, collectively, continuing to work collectively on these activities, but we've also heard mention of the Bureau for Energy Efficiency. I know CLASP is in the audience. Many different organizations and institutions, so we welcome participation uh, in this proposed uh, consortium LC4 so that we can all collectively move forward with low carbon comfort and cooling coalition. Thank you.